All right, guys. Um, first on the agenda today, I wanted to let you know that Vince Vaughn came up to me again last week, um, demanding that we get on his Pink Floyd case. Mm. If you both remember, uh, yeah, he's back, and uh, he really wants to make Pink Floyd a thing. Yeah. Um, you explained again. I mean, this isn't just us saying this. This comes down from the top. This is from corporate headquarters that. He knows that he can't just call his new band Pink Floyd, right? Yeah, I mean, I I literally, literally took out a Pink Floyd CD and played it for him and told him this this was already a band. And I know he's been told that multiple times, but I figured playing the music might, you know, bring about some kind of, I don't know, brain activity? No. No. Nothing. I mean, I remember I showed him um, an LP of The Wall, and I, like, right in his face, and his expression, normally... You know, Vaughn is so animated and such a talent. But face just dropped. Eyes glassy. Like, almost a state of pure catatonia. When, whenever, like, evidence of Pink Floyd. Like, it's almost like he's travelled back in time and met himself. Like, it's that level of, of emotional and mental death. As soon as I take the album away, he's fine again. Like, he just suddenly snaps back into it and talks as if... Pink Floyd, as if you know, as if that part of the conversation never occurred, and he's straight back to why can't, why won't you let me chase my musical dream? Well, this isn't anything really all that new for Vince. I mean, there was that time that he came to us with the manuscript uh, for Moby Dick. Yeah, and I, you know, I mean, great manuscript, really fantastic. Yeah, I really like the the whole plot point about sort of. Was Leonardo da Vinci part of some sort of conspiracy? What's really going on with the Knights Templar and, and sort of paintings of Jesus and everything? Um, but again, Moby Dick is is the name of another book. Right. Yeah, you know, we couldn't just do that. It wasn't, It's it, you can't just call it the same thing. And it, it's weird because same problem with the Pink Floyd. I showed him a copy of Herman Melville's Moby Dick, mm-hmm. glassed over completely, and then I'm pretty sure he doesn't think whales exist anymore. Like, it just, you show him a picture of a whale now, and he has the same problem. That catatonia comes over him completely. Holy shit. That explains a lot, actually. Every time, every now and then he checks Twitter on his phone and just goes glassy-eyed. I've been wondering what that is. But now I know. And, and yeah, I mean, at some point, maybe we have to sit Vince down. I don't know if there is actually some sort of, of mental trigger in his brain, or if he's just putting it on to deflect. Because he, he has that habit. Uh, like that time when I, I kept for years telling him, look, you've got to find yourself another job, you've got to do some work, you can't just sit there playing Tomb Raider all day. And he just look, just goes, meh. As if he doesn't understand. You know, with that, that weird phone. Meh. And I'm like, look, you know, they're working on a new Jurassic Park. Maybe you want to go back and reprise your classic character there. Uh, he just thinks making, like, grunting like a Neanderthal will get him out of criticism. And it doesn't. And, and I think this is a new method of his acting out, of his trying to get away with things. Like that time he came in in a tight green dress telling everyone he was Katy Perry. He wasn't even putting on a voice. That's the bit that insulted me. It's like, you can't just put a black wig on and a, and a teal dress and call yourself Katy Perry. And again, just, just drooling almost, a coma, when I show him that gif on the computer of Katy Perry like riding up and down and it's cut in such a way that it looks like she's having sex, but she's not. But you can convince yourself she is. And nothing, nothing from him. I, that gif... That gift and, and the Elmo one with the Elmo shirt with the boobs bouncing up and down. I've never seen anyone not react to that. Him, just, just like, you think he was Stephen Hawking. Which is to say nothing of that time he pretended he was Stephen Hawking. Well, now that was just absolutely offensive. It, it was important. Stephen Hawking is a, a, a brilliant uh, theoretician, a, a, a physicist beyond compare. 
And so, you know, it's insulting to just hop into a wheelchair. You know, I mean, I realize that Vince Vaughn didn't have to change his mannerisms to any significant degree to, to pull off that so-called satire. Not really, no. I mean, he, he kind of rolled it in a wheel. Again, it's the lack of effort that upsets me. Like, you can't just roll in on a wheelchair and not even have a computer or a text-to-speech thing, but just look at you and go, Hello, I am Stephen Hawking. I played Superman in the old films, and now I am a scientist. You're not convincing anyone. The strange thing is, you know, this music he wants to play as the band Pink Floyd, it sounds... Nothing like Pink Floyd. No. You know, he goes on and on in his music about, there's like Lord of the Rings references, something about cashmere. I'm like, this doesn't even, I don't even know what's going on. Well, and what's so strange about it is that it's like bluegrass, which I did not see coming. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't expect a whole lot of banjo and country twang coming out of Vince Vaughn. Uh, and then pairing that, yeah, with the sort of Tolkien high fantasy epic elements, it is a strange combination. Well, I mean, I... I... Gave a listen to his his debut sort of selection of tracks. Like he wants to call it the White Album, and I was kind of impressed. I mean, it's it's ambitious, it's unique, and he's kind of undoing himself by by trying to present it as as another instalment from the band Pink Floyd. Um, or again, you know, he claims he's not, but I don't know who he's helping, and he's not letting us help him. I'm like, come on, Vaughn, pull it together, please. You don't think there's some other band name we could convince him to to take up? He didn't have any other alternatives for his band prior to Pink Floyd. I mean, even like Floyd Pink. Yeah, we could we could throw that out there. Yeah, we could get Just, away with Floyd Pink. It'd be a bit awkward, but at least it would be legal for one thing, and and it wouldn't be tricking people into thinking Pink Floyd had a new album out. But again, like he he won't have it. He. He seems to think that telling him he can't call his band Pink Floyd is the same thing as telling him he can't have a band. And I'm like, you can have a band. You can do whatever you want. You just can't call it Pink Floyd or Maximo Park. You can't do it. Yeah, he threw a temper tantrum when I told him last week. He literally threw down his pen and paper. He came into the meeting all prepared, and he threw it down and left and started crying in the hallway. He has a propensity for that. I remember I told him he couldn't legally change his name to The Hobbit, and he kicked the leg of my desk. He has no respect for his own brand. He has no respect for the brands of others. Although, I gotta, I gotta admit, that would have been excellent brand synergy if, if he had been able to change his name to The Hobbit. It would have if he'd have gotten the audition to, to be in The Hobbit. But Hugo Weaving made a better Elrond. I can't argue that. Well, Hugo Weaving didn't put on a pirate voice. Quick question. I, I meant to bring this up a little earlier. Does anyone know why Ron Perlman is out in the hall, crouched over, like, almost, uh, like, knees and, and fists? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm glad someone brought it up because I'm glad to share with you that Ron Perlman has obviously been looking for a new line of work. He's kind of sick of the acting game. Yes, Pacific Rim uh, made him a lot of money, but he's out of that now. He's got enough money. He wants a secure career, something he feels that he could keep doing long, long after the age of retirement because he's getting older. Uh, he can't do Hellboy forever. And so that's why he's decided he's going to be a bicycle from now on. You mean, like, he's going to open a bicycle shop? No, he is, he is hoping that Triumph of Will and Mind Over Matter uh, will allow him to uh, metamorphose, uh, per se, and become an actual, the world's first, in fact, living bicycle. I took him to the uh, movie store for his birthday. I let him buy any DVD he wanted, and he went with Disney Pixar's Cars 2. Uh, I told him he hadn't seen the first one, he didn't give a shit. But he went and watched Cars 2, was enamoured with it, said, you know what, that that is right up my alley. And I said, what, well, you want to do voice acting, um, kids movies, that kind of thing? And he went, no. I like the fact that they are cars that are people. Clearly that's been done, because we can see those cars there, very fine actors they are. Has anyone ever been a living bicycle? 
And I said, well, you know, technically there's never been a living car. That was just a movie. And he said, fuck off. How do you think they made Christine and Herbie the love bug? And I, just, I let him have it. you got to let Ron have these things. And so I kind of relented and said, no, to my knowledge, there has never been a living bicycle. Are you interested in being one? And he said, yes. Uh, so I've been riding him to work uh, the past couple of days. It's been hard for him because um, obviously I'm, I'm not a small man. And I live about three cities away from the head office. And me sat on his back while he crawls on his hands and knees from my home to the office. Over the course of, um, you know, 100 miles or so. It's slow, admittedly. I get up at one in the morning now uh, and don't have time for a shower. He's in the garage, eating out of a dog bowl. I get on his back and he crawls me to work over the course of... Of, of 12 hours, I eventually get there. And, okay, we can start to see a bit of bone coming through his uh, hands and his knees. The the whole bottom from the knees down of his pants have, have eroded away. But he won't accept another change of clothes because he said bicycles don't need clothes. So we're just kind of rolling with it. Literally. Not literally. He hasn't got wheels. <sighs> That's a problem, you know. First of all, bicycle implies, you know, wheels. Yeah. Has he gotten any... Has he looked at all into maybe getting some wheels? Um, and just, like, you know, holding them? Right now, he's against the idea. I said, we could, I could get you some bike wheels, and we can, like, maybe try and fix them to you somehow. And he's like, no, I gotta do this. So, as far as I know, especially when he's out there in the hall, when he's not in use... He's just got his hands clut like, just put the palms of his hands, presses them together, and presses his knees together, and just thinks about them being wheels. And his only understanding that, in his mind, you know, the human brain is capable of anything, so long as you dedicate enough of your mental capacity to it, he believes that in time... Uh, over the course of maybe 20 to 30 uh, intensely painful years, uh, his bones will fuse together and take on a round shape and hinges and cogs, and then he will uh, essentially be a, a bicycle of flesh and bone. I gotta say, you know, it's really refreshing to see someone in the entertainment industry thinking about the long term, mm -hmm. you know? It's so uncommon... And I, I really have to respect that. I'm pretty sure the human body doesn't function that way, and he's never going to become a bicycle. But I admire him for trying. It's that classic Ron Perlman tenacity that we've all come to know and love. That's why I loved his work in the Stella Artois commercial. Uh, he is a man with an idea, and he will not stop until that idea is finished. I admire that style of method acting. I mean, especially, you know, when those actors like Christian Bale, they take it on, they they lose the weight or whatever it takes to, to get into the character or the role. But in Ron Perlman's case, what's his end game? Does he, does he feel that he will be cast as the next Disney Pixar, you know, Bicycles movie? I he says this is not about him. He says he hopes eventually he'll inspire young actors to turn themselves into bicycles in future. And they can be the next generation of bicycle actors uh, and actresses. Uh, I know he's been phoning Jennifer Lawrence a lot, asking if she's interested in maybe being a trike. But, you know, I think all of us know it's not going to happen. Some have suggested it may be cruel and exploitative of me to use him as one co-worker called it a um, a lowly transport dog man but i think we should encourage it and you never know you know keep an open mind maybe we're the ones who are crazy and silly and maybe one day we'll wake up and find out that hey ron perlman's got wheels it's a kind of ghoulish ghastly set of wheels of, of misshapen cartilage and skin but he did it. Come on, guys. Let's give Ron Perlman a round of applause. Something he can never do now. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Good going, Ron Perlman. Um, Jim, 
and Conrad, um, I don't even know how to begin with this. I saw um, something a little bit uh, interesting on the conference room table earlier before the meeting started. Uh, and apologies if this is awkward, but are you trying to create like a TV series of some kind uh, relating to drugs? Maybe. I just don't know. I just don't know what to make of these. I, I think they're sketches of some kind. Uh, I threw them in the trash because I thought they were just doodles, but now I'm what? starting to think. You, th- you threw my DVD cover designs in the trash. Well, I didn't realize they That's were. That's important documentation. When the DVD comes out. What are they going to use for a cover now? A picture of Brian Cranston's ass. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about, Jim. What are you... What is this? It's a, it's a new TV show that I'm working on. I'm going to film. So you are working on a TV show, and you didn't bring this up? I'm a dark horse and a man of many talents. I'm not a PR man 24-7. Sometimes, maybe, maybe I'll need the PR when I am writer and director of, of a hot new AMC TV show. Uh, and And bring back a TV show that everyone's been waiting for for many years. When So you got, I, you got Brian Cranston, though. Yeah. This is the long-awaited Malcolm in the Middle follow-up. No, no. Oh, thank God. No, uh, I am actually resurrecting and, and producing a new season of Breaking Bad. What? Huh? Did you get, like, permission to do this? Yeah, how, from... I, I can't believe AMC just are going to let you make... Another season of Breaking Bad. Not to mention, they've got that uh, Better Call Saul spinoff going on right now. I, well, exactly. That's that... no better time to produce the next season of Breaking Bad. Like, like they finished Breaking Bad. Right. AMC wrapped it up. Yes. They don't need it anymore. How could you have kept this? Give it to a new generation of talent. How could you have kept this from us? This well, is a big deal, Jim. Well, I'm just floating the ideas right now. I've got a handy cam. I've shot a few scenes, but... But mostly, I've been spending most of my time designing DVD covers. Um, but Breaking Badder is going to be amazing. Breaking Badder. Breaking Badder. Uh, just when you thought it was safe to break bad, the bad gets broken. And AMC Starring Brian Cranston. AMC has signed off on this. We're, mm, we're okay to launch this? I'm thinking it's probably best we keep AMC out of it. Like I said, they don't want the show anymore. So I figured it's just fair game. Doesn't... Cranston's character die at the end of Breaking Bad? I don't know. I I like I, I stopped halfway through season three, but thanks for the spoiler. Um <laughs> but I, I I figured it was done, so I would just sort of pick up where it left. Okay, off. wait, hold comrade, there's I think there's a bigger issue here of Jim, you you don't have permission to create a breaking bad seat regardless I don't of don't need permission. It's done. You what do you mean it's done? Like, this is fair use, right? They're no, not making money off it anymore. But, but they are. They're still making lots of money off of it. No, of... they're not doing anymore. No, they're selling the stuff they already made in perpetuity, forever. That's how entertainment makes money. They don't make money at the outset. They make money on people buying it over and over and over again in different formats, in new releases, in new versions with extra footage and extra scenes. Merchandising. Digital uh, streaming. Merchandise, absolutely. Yeah, there's. It, it, it's not the making of the show that makes the money. It's the making of all the other shit surrounding the right. show that makes the money. Right, right. But get this, okay? The sh- the scene opens right in the New York desert. Okay, pans across. You see a tumbleweed, right? And a hand shoots out of the desert sand. Just shoots out, right, and grabs the ground. And lifts and pulls out. And it's it's Brian Cranston. And he looks at the camera and goes, Ah! Ye thought I was dead! But I'm not, actually! Now it's time to break bad! And then it goes down, ground, boom, ground, boom, 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 like that. And then Brian Cranston kicks open the door of his house and Skylar's in there and he goes, Skylar, I'm back from the dead, but I wasn't even dead. And I'm going to do Breaking Bad now. And I'm going to break so much bad. It destroys New York City. I'll destroy it with meth. Now where's Jesse Pinksman? And 
Skylar's like, oh, fuck, Brian Cranston's here. It's all gone to shit. Jess is in the next room. Ah, man, I'm going to go talk to him. And he goes in there and he sees Jesse Pinksman, the character from, that we all know and love from, from Breaking Bad. And he's like, Jesse, I'm going to cook enough meth to destroy New York City. And I need you to help me. And Jesse's all, no, I told you before, I don't want anyone to do with that. I'm out of the game. I don't want to break any more bad with you or anybody else. I'm just sitting here um, going to be writing and producing songs for my new band, Pink Floyd. So leave me be, please. And and he's like, shut up. What if I give you an hundred pounds? And he's like, okay, then I will do it. Uh, so they are then in the desert again. And they're cooking all the meth, right? They've got an oven uh, and a baking tray. And they're popping it in. And they're cooking up meth cakes. And they put them in bags. And then give it to um, a man called Gus Spring. And he's like, ah, I like all this meth. I'm going to take it and sell it. And he goes off. And then Hank from the DEA turns up. Um, obviously played by that guy from Porn Stars, and he's like, I don't know how much meth is in there, but if it's good, I want it. <laughs> and then Brian comes out with a, a cutlass and goes, Yar, you'll never take me meth. And uh, Hank is like, oh, I'm going to take your meth because I want it. <laughs> And then he pulls out a long sword, and they fight across the desert and fall down a cliff and blow up. And so this is the this is the first episode of of Breaking Batter. Yes. Then yes, uh, and and I foresee it lasting five seasons. Five seasons. Yes. Okay. So and then um, we come out with uh, two Breaking Too Bad. I see a a couple of. A couple of narrative challenges here <clears throat> with the <throat> script. Uh, New York, not a desert. Well, creative license, so next problem. A- at all. Like, no desert mm. whatsoever yeah. in-, in New York. Yeah. Bit of a bit of a bit of dissonance. Mm. Uh, the other thing is, if crack didn't kill New York in the, in the 80s and 90s, Meth doesn't have a chance today. No one will believe it. Well, Brian Cranston is a master chemist, so he could make enough meth to destroy New York City. Next problem! And then there's the problem with the, the lawsuit that will inevitably arise once AMC discovers the existence of Breaking Batter and sues us into oblivion. Is that because Jess is in a band called Pink Floyd? Fish Shark Marketing is Jim Sterling, Conrad Zimmerman, and Caitlin Cook. Theme music by Ben Rama. Segway music by Alazar Chan. Our editor is Nick Malone. More episodes are available at fistshark.com. Follow us on Twitter at fistshark for more of our exploits. And if you like us, give us a rating or review on iTunes. Complaints can be forwarded via email to fistsharkmarketing at aol.com. And remember, one day, you won't even notice us at all. Goodbye. Goodbye.